Trade Unionist. He's a trade unionist, a fighter, an orator, and a thinker. He became one of the leaders of the Upper Clyde Shipyard Working, which ran from June 1971 to October 1973. The foundation is arranging a series of events and activities and publications to mark the 50th anniversary of the UCS working during that period. So please check our website for updates. In one of his most famous addresses at the start of the working, Jimmy warned over certain industrial behaviours and declared that the eyes of the world are upon us. Jimmy himself rose to international prominence during and beyond UCS. He became director or was elected director of Glasgow University. He was a broadcaster, a, commenta a commentator and the a founder of the Scottish Left Review. The Jimmy Reid Foundation was created 10 years ago in Jimmy's memory as a think tank to continue his legacy of radical political thinking. But for tonight, which we're now recording this event, we are launching our latest paper, which is Beyond a Just Transition by Dr. Yurik Skandrik, who's a senior lecturer in sociology at Queen Margaret University, a long-standing campaigner and trade union activist and a fellow member of the Jimmy Reid Foundation Project Board. But as a member of the University and College Union, IREG is on strike this week over pay and pensions. Tonight's meeting, therefore, IREG is speaking in his capacity as an activist, which is entirely separate from his day job and we're not paying him to be here. The Reid Foundation sends solidarity to the UC, UCU strikers and hopefully we can place a link to the UC, UCU's fighting fund in the chat for this meeting so people can, can live um, send donations to their struggle. The format for tonight is Eric is going to speak to his paper, but we have three discussants. We will, we will discuss around the question of trade union and environmental movements, how we can work together and learn from each other in a way that goes beyond a just transition. And those are Sam Mason, who's a policy officer at my union, PCS, and Dave Moxham, who's the Deputy General Secretary at the Scottish TUC, and also a member of the Scottish Government's Just Transition Commission, and Alison Roach, who's a policy officer at Unison. And Alison tonight is replacing Fiona Montgomery, who was originally billed to be here, but we will welcome Alison into our fold tonight. So that's enough from me. I want to now pass over to Eirig to speak to the paper. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn, and uh, uh, greetings from the uh, picket lines and rallies of the UCU uh, industrial dispute um, today, yesterday and tomorrow. Um, uh, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I want to just speak a little bit about what this uh, paper is about and look forward to having a discussion with the with, uh, comrades who have agreed to join me with that. Um, Just Transition uh, originated as a trade union involvement in transferring workers from uh, jobs that are likely to disappear uh, because of their dependence on the fossil industry um, and transferring the workers into the new jobs that uh, will be generated in the new sustainable economy and ensuring that the new jobs have the same terms and conditions and union protection as the old jobs so that's where the idea came from that link between the trade union movement and the uh, environmental uh, uh, requirements of, of, of the economy for many years, Just Transition was a fairly niche interest. Um, I remember in 2004 at the World Social Forum that I attended in Mumbai, um, I attended a workshop on Just Transition and found that uh, the facilitator and I were the only participants. Um, fortunately, in recent years, Just Transition has made um, much greater intervention into policy. Um, including thanks to the uh, ITUC's work, it's mentioned in the Paris Agreement preamble, 
um, uh, uh, of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in Scotland, to the Scottish Government's decision to establish a just transition commission, uh, which reported earlier this year in May this year, uh, with some 24 recommendations to deliver a just transition in Scotland, many of which are ambitious. In this process, the, the concept of just transition has expanded beyond the narrow focus on jobs in the fossil dependent industries to include other issues such as fairness and access to new jobs, in particular uh, um, sectors of, of the population that are underrepresented in the uh, fossil uh, industries, women, black and ethnic minority uh, workers, etc., and also in regeneration of post-industrial poverty. So just transition is now a term used by a wide variety of different actors. And in some cases, trade union involvement has disappeared altogether. I think it's important that the, the trade union movement reclaims just transition and looks at what just transition actually is at its essence. And this paper is a, a small contribution to that aim. In a fast moving and often technical policy area, um, I decided it wasn't uh, appropriate for me to focus on particular policies except where they illustrate a, a more generic argument. But rather what I wanted to do was look beyond what we might call actually existing just transition to what the potential for just transition might be. So the paper was obviously written prior to COP26, uh, although the thrust of the argument is unaffected by the outcome of the Glasgow COP. Um, it was fairly predictable that the COP would not be a major breakthrough. Um, and I think we can agree it more than lived up to the disappointment expected. Uh, today, even the climate change, the UK's climate change committee has reported that the UK is missing its own Glasgow targets by some way, uh, and that at current rates, the UK will be contributing to what the BBC is called a disastrous temperature rise of 2.7 Celsius by, 20, uh, by 2100. The current process of tackling climate change is not working. I'd argue largely because it is based on the interests of the ruling class. The different ruling classes in different countries, but always the ruling class. The investors, the banks, the corporations, and the governments that are in league with them cannot be trusted with solving climate change, let alone delivering a just transition. Capitalist, private investment-driven economic decision-making puts capital accumulation above the interests of labor and the environment. These can be modified the, uh, to the, the interests of, the, of, of capital accumulation, can be modified to ameliorate the interests of labor and the environment. And indeed, collective action by trade unions and environmental campaigns has uh, somewhat achieved that. But they cannot challenge, they cannot too strongly affect the bottom line of the investors. Fundamental to just transition then is the collective interests of, on the one hand, the working class, and on the other, the global environment. The former is represented, albeit imperfectly, by the trade union movement, and the latter is represented again imperfectly by the environmental movement. But fundamentally, the collective interest of the working class and of the global environment is what is at stake here. I argue here that finding a way to tackle climate change with justice can come from a synthesis of the interests of the working class and the environment. And central to that is a dialogue, what I sometimes call a deep dialogue between the trade union movement and the environmental movement. That means confronting where the two movements disagree, to challenge one another, to listen hard to what the other is really saying and to seek a means of incorporating the interests of the other into the interests of our own movement. My experience with the Just Transition Partnership 
is that we are quite good at trying to find common ground between environmentalists and the trade union movement. And that's a major achievement on uh, where we were a number of years ago. But common ground is not enough. We need to go beyond the where we can agree um, to addressing the difficult questions of where we disagree. This is not new. And in the paper, I make a number of references to, for example, the Lucas Aerospace Alternative Plan of 1976, which I think started to uh, take um, account of the fact that if workers control production decisions themselves, it becomes uh, of, of common interest. It answers some of the difficult questions of, um, uh, of, of industrial production. And in the paper, I start the, the publication with a quotation from Raymond Williams from a, a CIRA pamphlet in 1982. Uh, and I quote, if environmentalists and trade unions do not really listen to what the other is saying, there will be a sterile conflict which will postpone any real solutions at a time when it is already a matter for argument whether there is still time for the solutions, end quote. I would argue that we are in a better position to really listen today and that this is a call for that dialogue to take place. What I mean by dialogue or deep dialogue is, and I'm quoting from the paper here, deep dialogue is not an argument or a compromise, but a radical process of taking seriously the analysis of allies where we disagree and seeking to transcend them. It is only through such difficult dialogue, based on solidarity and collective self-reflection, will the mutual exploitation of class and climate for capital accumulation be challenged. Any social movement emerges in conditions of exploitation and mobilizes to challenge those conditions within a system of exploitation whilst also seeking to overcome that system. That applies to the trade union movement within uh, the exploitation of labor and the environmental movement in terms of the exploitation of the environment. Thus, social movements always have contradictions. There are contradictions in the trade union movement. The short-term interests of sections of workers versus the long-term interests of the working class. It's something that trade unionists are familiar with, uh, the difficulties. The dependent on the investment decisions of those who will exploit. Lucas Aerospace Joint Shop Stewards Committee fundamentally challenged this uh, contradiction or embedded them that, that in, in that contradiction. If workers have more control, then decisions about production can be driven by working class interests what they called socially useful production. And there are similar initiatives elsewhere where workers have, have tried to control production. Jimmy Reed and the UCS working is a great example of that, but also in defense di diversification and uh, toxics use reduction. There are also contradictions in the environmental movement. The environmental movement is dependent on science to which few have access, whereas the victims of environmental destruction are disproportionately amongst the poor, the working class and the socially exploited. The environmental justice movement has fundamentally challenged this. The collective mobilization of those exploited at the point of extraction, production and distribution rather than consumption can target environmental destruction at source. The environmental movement itself is diverse ideologically. Some environmental NGOs align with ruling class interests and are seduced by ideas such as natural capital, carbon markets, and nature-based solutions. Others take their lead from the victims of environmental destruction the environmental justice movements of the poor, black and indigenous peoples. Environmental justice movements are at the forefront of climate justice and therefore allies in the just transition. 
one area of uh, fundamental contradiction of, uh, of contradiction of disagreement is the issue of net zero versus real zero. In a uh, um, an important publication produced earlier this year by Friends of the Earth International in alliance with a range of environmental and social justice organizations called Chasing Carbon Unicorns, they argue that net zero is actually a, 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 a way of hiding the interests of uh, the corporations and the investors. Net zero means that you can um, continue to exploit uh, uh, fossil fuels, you can continue to extract fossil fuels and use them in the hope that on the that you can then take the carbon back out of the atmosphere, either through end of pipe solutions, such as the negative emission technologies, carbon capture and storage and so on, which so far has yet to um, demonstrate that it has the capacity to uh, absorb so much carbon dioxide, or through the double counting of nature-based solutions, which is essentially um, preventing further destruction of forests and, and ecosystems, which um, have, have already been uh, largely destroyed uh, through development. So in that radical uh, challenge, um, but in that radical challenge, the environmental movement has not taken on board, well, what happens to workers in this, in this uh, um, real zero economy? Um, and that is a, a fundamental uh, area of, of, of difficulty, which I think we need to talk about. I think we need to have that conversation, that deep dialogue about how do we get to real zero and how do we do that transformation in a way that um, protects the interests of working people. There are other areas of contradiction which I think this deep dialogue that is at the heart of just transition can, um, can, can, can move forward. Um, I'm quoting uh, here from, uh, from the, the paper, the processes of economic democracy of the trade union movement and the principles of dialogue implied in just transition can be deployed to address, address other areas of the economy that have been identified as unsustainable and dangerous to working people, but on which working people are dependent. Environmentalists and trade unionists, each living with our own contradictions, have been in conflict in areas such as chemicals production and use, nuclear power, weapons manufacturing and defense. These are all areas where a deep dialogue rather than an argument is going to move us forward. If environmentalists and trade unionists continue to uh, in, argue over these things, as has been in the, the, the case on climate change in the past, it is only the corporate interests who benefit. This leads me to the final argument of the paper, which concerns quality of life, in which I draw heavily on the work of Andre Gortz from the 1980s. If quality of life is to be assured for all, it will need to be divorced from income. And for all to have meaningful work, this needs to be separated from dependence on employment. So just transition has the potential not just to move workers into new jobs, which are equally as dependent on corporate employers and equally as fragile to the changes in uh, investment decisions, but rather has the potential to move to a form of quality of life where, which is not dependent on employers and not dependent on, uh, uh, on employment. Separating work from employment and um, quality of life from income is um, a way in which just, just transition can lead us. The focus on quality of life, the base quality of life, not on consumption, um, 
the, the trade union movement needs to emphasize the necessity not just of more jobs, but of, of sufficient, socially useful work distributed fairly and a good quality of life. Trade unions can focus alternatively on the production of, on the protection of incomes without dependence on employment or employers, or further on quality of life of which purchasing power becomes a poor measure as time becomes more self-directed and essential services are provided by the state. Separation of income from wages, work from employment, quality of life from consumption is building on the trade union tradition of shorter working week, shorter working day, conditions such as um, parental leave, family friendly flexibility, pensions, and indeed, some of the um, issues that UCU is currently in dispute with our employers, workload, casualization, and defined benefit pensions. These are quality of life issues, which have always been at the heart of the trade union movement and can take us into this area of separating um, uh, uh, quality of life from dependence on employers. We've recently seen um, and a, a, a little snapshot of where that might work with the furlough scheme, which even a conservative government was able to uh, implement. And at one time, 25% of employee, employees were being paid not to work because of the crisis of the COVID emergency. It's given us a little glimpse of if that uh, was implemented in a much more planned, better managed, prepared for and targeted way, it would enable the just transition to the kind of socially just and ecologically sustainable society that we, that, um, that we need. The shock of the economy of the COVID-19 pandemic needs to be replicated, but under controlled conditions. The just transition needs to be an economic shock because the, the, the change from the uh, conditions that we currently have, unsustainable and exploitative, um, needs to be radical. It needs to, a system change, as the environmentalists say, not climate change. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eirik. And um, <clears throat> can I just say that you may not be working tonight in your capacity as a as an educator, but I've certainly learned a fair few things um, about our movement and the, some of the contradictions that, that we have in the trade union movement um, and also those in the environmental movement. And um, it's opened up kind of a, a whole lot of thoughts for me about um, how people work together to, um, <clears throat> to, to the better good. So thank you very much for introducing your paper and what I'm going to do now is turn to the discussants and ask each of them in turn um, to, to respond and then if we have time, which hopefully we will, um, open up for questions and contributions and then come back to all of you at the end to um, <clears throat> for any closing remarks. So the first discussant this evening is um, Sam Mason, who, as I, as I said in the introduction, is a policy officer at the PCS Union. So um, welcome, Sam, to the floor. Thanks, Lynn, and thanks, Eirig, for that introduction to your paper. Um, I think you're probably trying to spotlight me, but I can't find how to do it myself. Um, here, I think I can done it there you go um yeah th thanks Irig. um one for writing the paper and it's very thought-provoking and for that introduction and thanks to the jimmy reed foundation to have this opportunity to both discuss it and personally to um make a contribution in terms of a, a response to it when i saw the headline to the paper it was quite interesting because before reading it it threw up two things in my mind seeing that term beyond tra just transition when we're still very much 
grappling with the whole concept of just transition. Um, so the immediate one was an uneasiness, uneasiness around the term just transition, um, what it actually means, the variety of definitions that exist and which you point out in the paper. But I also think fundamentally that since you know, six years since the Paris Agreement and getting those words within the preamble of the Paris Agreement, it still hasn't transcended into the sort of everyday language of the trade union movement and more fundamentally on the shop floor of the trade union movement is where we need those discussions to be happening. So I think many of us have felt over the past few years that whilst we fought for this language, it's not um, the best of language in it sort of readily meaning something like, um, you know, some other trade union concepts have over time, such as living wages or things like this. We always have to explain it and discuss too much around it. So that was just one thing. The other thing, and um, particularly in the run up to the COP as well, I think that what you opened up with that sense of having to reclaim the language was something that many of us had talked about and were very nervous about how it had been co-opted by corporations, by governments, um, by you know the NGOs, the environmental movement, some in a good way, obviously some just tacking it on the end of sentences without any real value to it. But we've also started to develop new terminology as well, which has come out of that, which you know some of us have started talking about a just transformation. Some of us talked about a justice transition and obviously lots of what we were doing in the, the trade union movement and the wider climate movement um, around the COP was about that whole centrality of justice um, within outcomes for the COP but also within our own demands as a trade union movement but as a wider climate movement as well. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, that we're getting into some deeper understandings about what just transition really is. And I think what you, you didn't touch on, I don't think then in your sort of presentation that's in your paper, which is about the sort of what and how, which are really fundamental because um, what you have really touched on is that we've got some fundamental disagreements within our own movement, within the, the wider um, climate movement, if you like, around really what the just transition is, but what we're transitioning to. So I pick an obvious one around nuclear power. Um, my union, for example, we're opposed to nuclear power, but obviously other parts of the trade union movement aren't. Um, we need um, a discussion around that, but it's very difficult to have. So I think um, I just want to touch on a, a couple of things. One around the concept of deep dialogue. Um, the other, which I've talked about a bit, but the notion of just transition, but also some of the things that you talked about, such as um, socially useful production and the Lucas Aerospace workers and those concepts of who actually gets to decide what we do and what the, the big plan is. But um, so the deep dialogue one, I thought was really interesting because I, in, in a way, I suppose for some of us within the COP coalition that we developed, and I know there's many comrades on the, the call here who were part of these processes, actually going back over two years with the delay to the COP, where we did try to bring together obviously a, a very broad climate justice movement and for the first time I think really having the trade unions involved in that and we established the trade union caucus which I think was a really helpful process of starting to bring together some of the worker voices into some of the sections of the environmental movement that perhaps haven't had those direct contacts before with trade unions um, that you know might have heard about us and, and what we do but not really understanding some of our demands around workers justice and why it's not just a question of you know shutting down North Sea um, oil and gas but we need to have a process that obviously protects workers through the process and communities in which workers um, live as well. But it also brought me back to a paper um, which some of you may be familiar with that was written by Trade Unions for Energy Democracy um, back in 2018, I think it was, which talked about building social power um, and challenged some of those notions within the just transition narrative around social dialogue and worker 
representation, um, for example, and having a seat at the table, that that wasn't enough um, because clearly that wasn't giving us a voice at the table or lead in those negotiations and really having to be part of more of you know, what might be called a social movement trade unionism where we're building our allied base around um, both obviously within our movement but outside our movement as well and I think that sense of deep dialogue really speaks to that notion as well and I, I think we very much do have to have those discussions as well um, that tackle the issues of power and class and obviously the um, that the nature of capitalism and its inherent inequalities and while it's not enough just to, to argue for uh, sort of green growth capitalism and just transition within that context, which um, was the, the next bit really I wanted to talk to because I agree that it, it's not just enough that we look at jobs plans, there's plenty of plans for, for jobs um, that workers could transition into, but I think what's been really indicative, particularly over the, the past year or so with the COVID pandemic, the transition is already happening. We've seen lots of transitions, and I think one area where PCS has um, representation of members in the aviation sector, um, there's been a lot of changes in that industry, and it's kind of quite ironic that an industry where lots of people lost their jobs, you've now got this, not just a, a rise again, a sort of going back to, to normal. Um, obviously, that was before the, the latest um, new variant came out, but, you know, a sense of driving the, the business back up, but also looking again at expansion plans. And, you know, I can just think of an example of Gatwick Airport down in the south, where they've now talked about, you know, an additional runway, and this will create more jobs. We have no sense of irony about all the jobs that have actually just been lost due to covid um so it's what we've termed um this kind of boom and bust cycle obviously of the business model so even without the the climate challenge that already exists um and there is little point to recreate the sort of so-called green economy um within that whole business model again but the the question about who decides and how um i think is a really important one now as a union, we supported the Lucas Aerospace um, ideas around socially and e what we call ecologically useful production and also the need for obviously the state to play a really strong role and have an industrial strategy. But clearly, you know, just leaving it to the state isn't enough. And certainly through the, the work done through trade unions for energy democracy and looking at those issues of democratic control, not, not just ownership structures, which are really important. It's about how you sort of manage the democracy within the state as well, and who gets to decide what that industrial strategy is and what those jobs are. And I think that emphasis on the kind of quality of life around um, is very important and I think important as well because some of the just transition concepts came out very much around the occupational health and safety and that you know the health and well-being of workers but also within local communities so I think it always has to be brought into how we link the notions of just transition to the wider communities equally and the Lucas Aerospace Workers Plan was very much part of that. It didn't just see what it was doing in its plant. It was looking outside to what was needed, you know, for example, the lack of, lack of kidney machines um, that they could easily make or produce more because they were making some at the time um, and how they needed to connect as workers to their communities. And when PCS wrote its um, Just Transition and Energy Democracy and Civil Service Perspective paper in 2017, we talked of this concept of a kind of worker public um, partnership because that was really about trying to link how as workers we actually do exist within a public sphere as well. Um, and it's not just about what we might do when we go into that workplace, but about how we're sort of engaging, having those discussions outside. So I think that's a really important point. Um, and, and also to emphasize Mike Cooley, who was obviously one of the, the leaders in the Lucas Aerospace, um, when he talked about whether you know we're architects or bees. So are we building the future or just reacting to it? And I think many of us 
think we need to be building the future and changing the future. But I suppose I just leave my contribution with throwing a question back and apologies if I had not picked this up in the paper. But I think it also leads to a discussion about our own forms of trade unionism and you know the the Lucas Aerospace workers at the time, this was looked at as a very um, new new trade unionism or new unionism as it was called. And are, would we be able to have these kind of deep dialogues within the structures we've got or do we need to change as well? Because I think you know what we see within our formal structures um, that we can't always have the kind of more comradely deep dialogue discussions that we need to be having where we might be able to have these, for example, in spaces like trade unions for energy democracy, but we can't have them when we go into somewhere like the trade union congress environment. Um, so I, I guess that's the kind of question. Do we also need to have that reflection within our own movement? And finally, just the other point around internationalism, of course, there is the, you know, as in the broadly defined global south that see the whole just transition as a northern industrial con construct as well. And that really doesn't look at the, the wider issues and their development models. So I think that's something that we also need to bear in mind within those deep dialogue discussions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. And thanks for, um, adding to your contribution there are some questions and we hopefully that, that when people come in um, and the contributions people can respond to that but certainly we'll give Eirig the opportunity at the end to, to come back on that. So our next um, discussant is Dave Moxham who's the Deputy General Secretary of the Scottish TUC. So over to you Dave. Uh, thanks very much indeed, um, Lynn. I should probably share with people, as uh, to start with, that Lynn is sitting in the um, other room from me, um, but I am also um, pinning and unpinning the speakers here, um, and that there's two bits of news today, which I'm just reading from my phone in the last hour, which I guess shows just how fast moving the, the situation that we're um, involved in now is um, in the last hour. Um, Shell has announced that it is um, pulling out of Cambo, um, and I'm also told that within the next um, hour or so we're going to hear um, the membership of the new um, just Scottish Government's Just Transition um, Commission. Um, so um, things are busy and things are happening, and I guess um, that's um, how it should be. Um, I want to thank very much um, I read for his paper. I think I haven't read it yet, but I do have the benefit of having engaged with you on the Just Transition Partnership for a number of years. So I think we have a, um, a fairly good idea of um, uh, our relative perspectives on this, which um, generally speaking uh, are very similar. Uh, and also um, Sam for your, for your first response. Um, I'm gonna talk about two of the concepts, I guess, or two of the main areas that um, uh, Eirik um, uh, introduced us to in, um, uh, in his introduction to his paper, um, the concept of deep dialogue, and I'm going to try and talk quite positively about the potential for what I'm going to describe as um, deep dialogue, but also the, um, the way we're defining just transition, the way that just transition is being redefined uh, very often by our enemies and what that means for the practical application of, of, of just transition in the, uh, in, in, in the period um, that we're facing. Um, I wrote a piece for um, uh, Jimmy Reed Foundation uh, for, the, uh, for the left review, should I say, um, uh, a couple of months ago, where I argued that there were, if you like, two emergent um, definitions of just transition. I've changed my mind since the COP and I now think that there were probably three because you know, throughout the COP, I think we saw a kind of corporate um, and governmental adoption of just transition that in many cases didn't have any just in it at all. It was simply a description about how key sectors, um, key areas of policy interest will transition because of the uh, prerogatives of climate change, but 
consume it with um, trickle down economics and a neoliberal philosophy. There was no idea particularly there that there needed to be any form of additional information uh, or intervention that um, ultimately the, uh, the market would decide. And that kind of um, uh, stealing really of just transition is a matter of enormous concern uh, and something that's going to be difficult to challenge because words are difficult to challenge for something that we have to do. Um, secondly, there is the, and I would call this the sort of mainstream center or um, center left understanding of just transition, which I would argue is where the Scottish government was at, is where the just transition commission that I was a part of uh, was at, which recognizes that there does need to be government intervention. There does need to be public intervention. Um, there does need to be social dialogue. Um, there does need to be some level, at least, of engagement, both with the communities who are affected, whether uh, in the north or the global south, um, and the workers through trade unions that are affected. Um, and there is a recognition that that intervention comes with the possibility of government, and in some case, the commitment of government uh, to introduce a whole range of conditionality in the Scottish context that would be um, the outcomes of the Just Transition Commission, which uh, has argued very clearly for the creation of Just Transition Plans. Those Just Transition Plans should um, involve a workers' voice, they should involve um, community voice, and if properly prosecuted by the new Just Transition Commission that will be um, delivering on that in the next um, four or five years in Scotland, there is um, a genuine opportunity for um, the interrogation of these transition plans, which will focus in particular sectors. We understand the first one, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, will be in energy, uh, but we'll also have to look at all the big uh, emission sectors. Um, and there is the opportunity there for trade unions and the opportunities for communities, and importantly, the opportunity for trade unions and communities together to interrogate these plans, whether on a sectoral level, whether in terms of um, a, a regional level, um, and, um, and hopefully, and this is what we really hope the next tra Just Transition Commission will, will be able to prosecute at a kind of company level. So every big player, whether that's regionally or um, uh, strategically within um, the economy, every player should be forced uh, to have a Just Transition Plan to show how the, um, the commitment to social partnership, not my favorite word, but nevertheless, the one that is used um, within the Just Transition Commission report will be delivered on. So we, we need to be seeing evidence of uh, union engagement, evidence of union recognition, evidence of genuine uh, community uh, and resource community participation. That's, if you like, what I would call a mainstream and relatively positive approach to just transition. However, there is a third, um, uh, uh, the, the, there is a third um, uh, iteration, if you like, of, of just transition. And that is the one which I guess is best summed up by the um, no climate change, um, system change uh, mantra, which we heard outside the COP, if definitely not inside the COP um, earlier um, this month. Um, and that is the view that the economy cannot be run, um, irrespective of how much conditionality we see, uh, irrespective of how much government investment we see, irrespective uh, of however well we organize within trade unions and communities to, uh, to temper the transition uh, in a more just way. Um, there is no um, uh, final outcome which doesn't involve uh, a complete change in the way that many of our key industries um, and much of our, our economy is run and that is about democratization it's about public uh, uh, ownership and it's about um, community ownership and certainly from an STUC perspective and I think a, a, a trade union perspective in Scotland whilst we will undoubtedly be engaging in the process of just transition as outlined by the Just Transition uh, Commission and is committed to, still to see how it's going to be delivered on by the Scottish government uh, and using every single lever and mechanism we can to, um, to argue for 
um, the genuine empowerment of workers and the genuine empowerment of communities through this process, we also need to be campaigning in key sectors for public ownership. And the SDUC's three strands of our um, uh, climate campaign at the moment are around the public ownership of buses, are around municipally delivered um, retrofit um, uh, and building programs that provide genuine justice for people in fuel poverty and good unionized jobs and for jobs in the renewables uh, and green manufacturing uh, supply chain. And it's our contention. And importantly, it's a contention that is um, shared with many of our friends, and I'll go on to this in the environmental um, and community campaigning movements. Um, the only way to do that is through um, public um, ownership, and we will be prosecuting those campaigns. Um, I've talked about deep dialogue, and I absolutely agree about deep dialogue. We have some really big elephants in the room that haven't been resolved yet. He touched upon many of them, uh, UK level uh, nuclear power generation, um, uh, a Scottish and UK level, the speed of um, uh, uh, withdrawal uh, of uh, um, oil and gas uh, production, um, faith or lack of faith in uh, carbon capture and other um, uh, net zero uh, technology. So a whole host of areas where the people that I sit down with on a regular basis, where the people that I campaigned with um, outside the COP uh, have differences with um, certainly um, uh, very many people, uh, particularly those workers affected in the trade union movement. And we do need that deep dialogue to get there. I guess what I think we saw over the last three or four weeks in particular, but has been developing over the last um, uh, number of years um, is a recognized recognition that the best way to have that deep, deep dialogue is also in an applied setting. So the joint campaigns that we have um, run, whether that was um, climate campaigners and community campaigners out supporting the uh, cleansing workers in Glasgow and the, uh, the striking uh, rail workers um, in, uh, across Scotland, um, or whether that's in some of our other shared initiatives that will build trade union and community power together. Uh, we need to conduct that deep dialogue whilst we actually build um, that kind of power um, in our communities and our workplaces at the same time. And I think the potential to do that is, is enormous. I think the recognition of the environmental movement that building uh, worker and community power is fundamental has grown. I think the recognition in the trade union movement that we need to be more proactive and greener um, and more open to um, some of the changes which potentially threaten the livelihoods of, of workers, but do have solutions if we, uh, if we find the right ones has grown too. Um, so I'm relatively positive. I, I recognize the challenges that I've spoken about, both in terms of the um, the way that just transition can be uh, taken from us uh, and redefined by uh, by the neoliberals uh, and others and i recognize the need and the uh, progress and the difficulties ahead in terms of that deep dialogue but i am genuinely optimistic and more optimistic post-cop than pre-cop that we are in a position now to apply some of that um, joint pressure to apply some of that argument, to take some of those um, uh, campaigns together uh, and hopefully ultimately um, reach a place where we are challenging for power as well as uh, challenging for change. I'll leave it there, Lynn, uh, and I'll come back um, uh, to any questions that people have to ask uh, as soon as I can. And I've now taken over the part of the job, which has me removing my pin and returning yours so hopefully folk can see you now okay Dan, thank you very much for multitasking dave and also um for introducing some of what you described as the elephants in the room um i think sam also referenced nuclear power but also oil and gas very um big topic here in in scotland and i think um, if we're to have a deep dialogue around some of these issues, it will also have to be a wide dialogue. So I'm going to bring in our third and final uh, discussant this evening, which is Alison Roach from Unison. So welcome, 
um, to the Jimmy Reid Foundation, Alison. Thank you, Lynn, and uh, thanks to um, IRIG, uh, Sam and David um, for the invitation tonight as well. Um, I'll just start off by saying that I don't think Unison, to be honest, has ever discussed how we would define just transition. I think we've perceived it more as an active thing where we do see it as a transformative process and inclusive of NGOs, communities and social dialogue with um, government and employers. Um, the definition itself is not standstill. So we actively have pursued a dialogue and active solidarity globally as well with PSI. I see Sandra's here today from PSI and EPSU, our European uh, colleagues. What I would like to say back to Irig though is that Unison has a proud history and a long history of working with NGOs and our green alliances. And actually we do quite a lot behind the scenes um, for example, we ha have basically for every COP since I've actually worked as policy officer on climate emergency, we have worked with the Green Alliance and all the alliances, Friends of the Earth, uh, UK wide, to mobilise both the trade union movement in solidarity for local marches. But we've also done other things such as prepare briefs and get a big campaign going with MPs and lords when we see attacks on environmental rights and protections, particularly over Brexit, where we knew um, that the Brexit agreement that we'd finally come up with, we're not going to have the, the level playing field that we demanded in environmental rights. We also though do a lot of work on trade and green rights because we've had to make in the last couple of years post-Brexit, big alliances with the trade justice movement where we've, we've made sure that we have put green rights again part of our dialogue around what we'd like out of all these new free, free trade agreements that the government is signing away that we have never been able to get sight of anyway because they're all secret. Uh, so we've done a lot of work around trade and what we want from our trade in terms of green protections. But we've also done stuff around the Energy Charter Treaty and that is a sticky area that Sam and David have mentioned because the, the trade unions are split globally on the Energy Charter Treaty. It's not even a domestic issue. I've been in global meetings where one of the reasons why it wasn't at the COP26 um, as part of the trade union kind of dialogue, if you like, was because there was just no agreement. So we've still got a lot of work to do. Uh, while the NGOs are certain, the trade union movement still has got a lot of work uh, to do on that. But there are other two areas I also want to talk about, and one is public procurement, because public procurement is worth trillions globally in both the supply of goods and services. And Unison, along with our European uh, colleagues in EPSU, we fought a real hard battle, and we, were, we did win to get, for the first time, um, green um, outcomes, if you like, when you have a procurement contract. Now, there's no percentage on it, but we've always argued it should be minimum 10%, that any contract awarded must have at least 10% of a green outcome. Now, that became a directive in 2014. Uh, so we have had some victories, uh, and actually it was the Green Alliance in Europe and the UK uh, working with Green MEPs um, that helped us on that. So we have had some victories, and right now I'm actually also a policy officer for digital and AI transformation. And we're calling for a just transition there too. Because since the pandemic, the amount of digitalization AI technology encroaching on our privacy rights, but also literally being written in secret WTO treaties, and we've had to make WTO alliances, United Nations alliances, and Sandra, who's here from PSI, will know exactly what I'm talking about because Sandra's been leading the public service global call for basically transparency. Digitalization AI um, basically is gonna be part of the green transformation, net zero transformation, just transition. And we've got to also get on board of how uh, we as a trade union also build a dialogue on that. So I've just explained some of the things we've been doing as a trade union and um, our policy committee is very much, um, you know, in favor of all the work we're doing. But it is complex. And whilst I've explained some of the things we've done with NGOs and our um, trade union affiliates uh, globally and in Europe, actually we've had very little success in building social partnership dialogue with our employers in public service sectors. 
whether it's health, local government, police and justice, housing, um, education, for example, water, environment, transport. There's, there's about nine public services under Unison, and it's not central government, which obviously is um, PCS, uh, which Sam can talk a bit more about. But essentially, because the pandemic, I guess, got in the way, I think NHS England, um, as far as we know, has been the only public employer which has set up a just transition board or a sustainable board and actually invited trade unions to take part. We've got no equivalent going on in uh, local government in the LGA. I know the Scottish government has made progress in social dialogue and partnership, and so has Wales. And Northern Ireland, um, I'm not sure, I couldn't comment on, but I don't think so. So across the UK, we've got a very patchy dialogue going on, to be honest. And so what we decided for COP26 was we wanted to produce a report to show what the problems are. How can we put pressure in creating that uh, dialogue? Because we, we, we believe we can use that as leverage to also get NGOs and our green alliances on board because we know we all want the same local community outcomes and national outcomes. So what we did is we produced a report which was very short and sharp and basically just said we've looked at nine sectors in public services and we've looked at five areas, um, buildings, land use, how we get to electric, um, public procurement, and I'll just turn my page over here, and waste, I think the fifth was the fifth one. And basically we just said, well, what is the government doing? Uh, what are they planning to do? What are the key milestones, i.e. cut-off points where if we don't get here, we're never going to get to 2050? And what we found was that overall, um, there's been very little uh, money invested, but lots of talk, lots of nice strategies, lots of nice paperwork. So we wanted basically to first of all say, that's great, no problem with that. Very good ambitions have been set by local authorities, by universities and by health boards, for example. But unfortunately, they are reliant on public funding. So what we then said was, well, how much is it going to cost? And we're looking at all four devolved nations here, uh, or assemblies, if you like. And we figured it would come to £140 billion to get decarbonise all public services in the UK by um, 2035, not even 2050. And the reason is because if we don't actually put in place up front the capital investment now, you can forget 2050 because you've got to basically do it by 2035. And I think the Westminster um, Climate Change Committee itself said, you've got to get all the easy things done now or else you'll never get to the harder things beyond 2035. So that's why we've kind of had that cutoff point what I would then say is we said that you can look to the private sector, which the government is, it's asking for 90 billion pounds from the private sector, but it's not coming. And so we've gone back to say we need it to come, that capital investment must come from the UK government. Now the government has committed chunks here and there, in our report you can see where we've shown you where it is, but it's not gonna be enough. And if the government continues just paying the little bits it is now, between now and 2035 we'll have a shortfall of 113 billion pound to decarbonize all the public services. And here I'm talking about just even the job of retrofitting all our buildings, but also all our social housing and community housing. It's a huge job. Now, also we've got skill shortages going on there. The government hasn't even got the technicians in place to retrofit or even do the electrical uh, changes, whether it's hybrid or uh, you're gonna have uh, just electrical boards, whatever. Um, so it's, Basically, it's, there's no show going on in town. And our other thing is, what interest has the private sector got to invest in the public service transition? Because what we'd argue is we don't want PFI, it failed in the past, it's too expensive, but also gas has failed, water has failed, all the public um, privatization of utilities has failed. So really, we've used the report to show that for taxpayers, it's much more better to keep it in public ownership and basically buy out those failed utilities and have a long-term plan, which is profitable for public services and taxpayers. So that's been one of our key demands. But I'd also like to say, because um, I know my time is getting short, 
I'll just skip now to some of the recommendations, which we believe um, is part of the dialogue we'd like to have that Eric has talked about. First of all, um, we need a separate green budget or just transition budget, whatever you'd like to call it, for public services. We can't use the same budget for everyday use because we're already austerity budgets. And basically you'll be stealing from our main budget to basically decarbonize. It's got to be a separate fund. The second thing is we've got to start now. And we'd like to see, and I think Scotland's led the way on this, are some just transition boards. They could be done regionally, they could be done at sector level, they could be done locally, they can be done by town committees. There's loads of ways that these could be set up. And in fact, some regions have already set them up on a voluntary basis. But we'd like them to be, we'd like really a duty for them to be set up, if you like, so that there's some sort of stick and uh, carrot, because funding could go through these bodies officially, as I've mentioned, for setting them up. But also, um, I would just like to say that public procurement must be modernised. There's a great opportunity to raise the barrier of green outcomes through public procurement and also introduce new global standards so that there are no environmental breaches in global supply chains. And we can introduce um, mandatory, mandatory human rights due diligence, which is a call we have globally. And we'd also like to see um, you know, new technology agreements in our green agreement, setting out how the use of AI, data or digitalization um, is going to produce a green outcome, but what are the job losses? What's the impact? For example, the health services said it wants to cut people traveling to A&E. Their way of doing it is to go from basically people on phone calls to chat boxes, and essentially that's a loss of people's jobs. So we need to have an impact assessment on digital and AI on how people are saying they're going to have get to uh, net zero. Um, so there are some of the things we are thinking of. I'd just like to say it's not just also about the engagement. We also made a big commitment two years ago to build our green net networks, branch and root in all our branches and all our sectors. And that was just to give confidence to our branch reps to talk to employers, but also to have a community wide focus so that they could basically also connect globally with the work we're doing, but also locally with those communities and green alliances. And they are already happening. So our focus very much is obviously making sure that workers are key to this transition, and, but also that the benefits go to the wider community and it has to be therefore inclusive of the community in the discussion and dialogue. And last but not least, we have asked and we always ask for it, mandatory facility time for green reps so they have the time to engage. So I'll leave it there, uh, Lynn, and hopefully that's a few ideas there. Thanks very much, Alison. And I mean, some of the ideas, you're right, across different parts of the, the UK in the public sector, um, there has been more progress, and especially around that envir environmental reps facility time here in Scotland. Um, <clears throat> however, I think that talking about the public sector is, as the Im imperfect beast that it is, is really also quite important in the dialogue about why um, we need to invest in public services to enable the public services themselves to participate in uh, the, the just transition. So we've now had the three discussants um, put in their perspective, what I'm going to do now is open up um, the meeting to questions and contributions from, um, from the rest of you, and then just for about 15, 20 minutes, and then at the end, I'll bring everyone else back in to, 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 summar to summarise. So if you want to participate, could you put your electronic um, hand up, which hopefully most people are familiar with the, 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 the Zoom, um, Zoom processes now that you know how to do it. While people are thinking about putting their hands up, um, just want to say that in the chat, there's, there's a lot of um, people adding some really interesting links and it's probably best for me to point them out now rather than towards the end of the meeting where 
you will um, probably be in a rush to, to leave and forget to, to copy the links. But there's a whole lot of interesting links to all sorts of publications um, and websites that, 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 that adds to this debate. So I'm still looking and I can't actually see anyone unless for some reason they're not. Ah, here they come. Here they come now. OK, I'm going to take them in the order that that, that you've arrived in um, on my list. So um, first first up then is uh, Rachel Shanks. So can we unmute Rachel? I've done it, hopefully. Yeah. Done it yourself. OK. Hi. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, so um, my question is about um, being frugal, because uh, just I recently read a book, oh, here we go. Um, I, I coordinate a course on sustainability at the University of Aberdeen. And the, the, the textbook that we set was this one by Felix Eckhart um, called Sustainability, Transformation, Governments, Ethics and Law, because it's an interdisciplinary course, so it fitted it the best. But his one of his key things that he talks about is that, especially you know, in somewhere like Scotland, we have to learn to be frugal. You know, we have to go from overconsumption, over every, you know, every area of our lives. We have to totally change so that we live within the planetary boundaries. And I just wonder. So I'm a member of, of UCU, but I've been a member of other unions in the past, and. I, I guess most of us here in public sector, sort of public sector unions, but it's that thing of what do we do in terms of moving to that frugality, you know, so stopping overconsumption, over travel, and um, just, you know, over everything. We, we consume too much, uh, we, we do too much, and actually to, to, to have a just transition and a planet that is habitable, we need to do a lot less of what we do, but obviously that has an impact, not just on jobs here, but obviously, especially jobs in you know developing countries. If we're buying less clothes, then that has a big impact on the, the fashion industry in Bangladesh and other countries. So I just wondered what people thought about that. That's a great question, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next one comes from Martin Childs. Hello there. Um, yes, I was interested in the actual transition uh, that was mentioned uh, various times. Um, I mean, Lucas Aerospace, um, good ideas all came up from the workforce themselves. But ultimately, it wasn't successful because the employer wasn't listening and uh, government wasn't, uh, didn't help them either. I wonder whether some of the emphasis perhaps should be on now workers co-ops as well. Um, because otherwise we're dependent on hoping that we can nationalize and um, make the changes that way. Unfortunately, that needs a progressive government to be elected. Short of that, I wonder if we could actually um, encourage legislation in some way or another towards easing up the transition of companies um, to worker cooperatives. So the sort of initiatives that co were coming from the workers at Lucas Aerospace in future could be put immediately into action by uh, democratically run workplaces, i.e. workers co-op. I wonder if any of the speakers have thought or anybody has any, uh, anything to say on that as a part of the mix. I'm not saying against nationalisation or anything like that, but I think that it's more immediate. We might have success with companies transitioning, especially when employers retire. It can be easy that, that you know the first um, offer should be given to the workers to buy them out, and that, especially in a small scale. Companies could um, you know could more easily um, be quickly um, transitioned into workers co-op. Anyway, that's, I just want to throw into the uh, discussion. Thank you, Martin, a really good observation. I think 
possibly Dave alluded to it when he was talking about democratizing the economy, but didn't specifically mention workers' co-ops. But I'm sure that they'll all want to come back in on that point. At the moment, there are no other hands up. I probably have time for another one or two. Here comes, here comes one. Um, over to you, Ian Mullen. Thanks, Lynn. Um, just a, a general sort of question to the panel. Um, my employer, Sir Edinburgh Council, has got a strategy document on retrofitting. However, um, the two pilot schemes that it had intended to carry out have been cancelled because of COVID. And uh, the retrofitting strategy says it will be complete by 2030. Um, we have a house in stock of over 22,000 uh, council houses, and there is nothing in the strategy document that actually talks about the funding of it. Um, I've had a couple of meetings with the um, organisers of the document, and uh, it's kind of difficult to understand where the funding is going to come from, bearing in mind that the Scottish Government funding for retrofitting will not come into place until uh, 2040, 10 years after the strategy document. The other thing that we have is uh, an environmental climate strategy, which um, is for also for 2030. And um, there's nothing in it with regards to training of tradespeople. There's a lot in it, well, not a lot, but there is reference made to training for IT services, um, but very little in, in respect of um, bringing in new, new um, hybrid and electrical vehicles and the training of staff. And I'd just like to hear what the panel think on that. Thanks. OK, th thanks, Ian. <clears throat> There's two other hands and I'm going to take Stephen and Richard and then I'm going to stop there so that all of our speakers get a chance to come back on on the, the point raised. So um, next is Stephen Gray. OK, that's great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, in terms of what I just building on what people were just saying there and the, you know, the questions, are there any lessons to be learned from other parts of the world, um, potentially even America? and in terms of growing grassroots, both trade union and community groups for just transitions and how we can apply them in Scotland and the UK. Um, obviously, we have shared problems across the world in that the national government are in the pockets of the corporate interests. So we have to work at lo local grassroots levels to build up the evidence base and the support and the local supply chains to deliver the just transition ourselves. So. Is it a question, not just a question of reaching out and finding good examples, but making links potentially with those people who are being successful at that? So again, it's, it's half a statement and half a question. And a very good one. Thank you very much, Stephen. You, and then. there are people um, on, on the call tonight from international trade union bodies um, and the, some of our speakers have, have referenced them. So it could open up a whole new meeting in itself. But it's a very good question. Thanks very much. So the final kind of open question then or contribution is from Richard. Uh, thank you very much. It's about, been a very good talk. Um, particularly I make uh, mention of Alison and the Unison's uh, very concrete strategy. I think it's a really new, good development. I hope that when it comes to putting it to the TUC in their negotiations with the, with, um, the government in terms of their energy transition committee, which at the moment is uh, they're waiting for any, any movement because at the moment it's a bit, bit stalled, to be honest, between the TUC and government. And I think Unison is a very great concrete strategy, 140 billion, and it comes in all sectors of the need for it. But my question is actually for Dave Moxham, really, and um, his, three, his three versions of what he said, John, tr just transition. Is the first one, the just transition, which we all think is a version of actually climate denial in the sense of business as usual, but 
because of the second and third version, I the more uh, more uh, sort of what you could call uh, partnership with promotion and also the the rejection of the system as it is, doesn't that bring pressure in terms of uh, with companies at the workplace in the sense that across the table, does that tip the balance in a way in terms of negotiations or not? At least bring out the hypocrisy of the first definition of just transition, that they're just not really interested or just to use, uh, um, use Greta Thunberg's uh, blah, blah, blah uh, definition of what? their just transition means. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Um, thank you, Richard. And uh, Dave will have an opportunity to answer your question directly. But I'm going to bring people in, in the, back in, in reverse order. So that means I'm going to start with Alison. And I say to all of our speakers, uh, you don't have to um, address all of the... <laughs> the contributions this evening, including the other discussants, but just anything that you that you want to um, bring in as your kind of closing remarks would be helpful. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll be quick. So I know um, Irig might want to respond as well. Um, yes, at the launch of report, we had the STUC, uh, the Wales TUC and um, the Scottish TUC there, and they're very much behind um, our report and the figures. Uh, so we do think um, it will be included in our strategy and our engagement uh, with the government. Uh, we are on some committees with the government and that's great, but again, <clears throat> there's no funding. So the two million green task fund they promised, there's absolutely no money towards it. So that's the situation, but we'll keep the pressure up. I just want to talk about uh, one thing in particular, which was about overconsumption, which I believe was the first question, because I think it's really important, because the Climate Change Committee um, has said um, changing people's behaviour is going to be huge. And, um, for example, we have nurses who complain about um, car parking prices to park in car parks when they get into their hospital. Yet we're, we've moved away from that and we, we're arguing actually for loans to get them bicycles to cycle to work. So we're, this is to me the Just Transition Live because we're jumping already uh, or we're trying to move our membership and engage them already about how we have to change that behavior and expectations. So it's really important. Another thing I just want to mention, which was actually in my original thing, but I didn't actually talk about it. The carbon border tax is where I think um, the trade union movement needs to have a really good discussion on it. I know the TUC last week, this week, sorry, at TUSDAC, where Sam and I sit, which is the Trade Union Congress Sustainable Development Action Committee, they're looking at whether the trade union should support a carbon border tax. And there's lots of sort of uh, things there which could complicate um, our position because will it be unfair eventually to glo the global south because it, it's quite protectionist so i'll just end on saying i think a good debate for us would be to have a discussion on that thank you lynn thanks very much alison i just want to thank you as well for for joining us tonight i know you're not feeling particularly well tonight so thank thanks for your your time too so um next up is dave moxham Thanks, Lynn. There was a kind of direct question to me there about my definitions, which I might come to regret um, in the future. And I'll try and uh, just touch on a couple of the other points that I think relate to that. I mean, I guess what I'm, I'm saying, and I, I guess I think I'm agreeing with the questioner on this, is that there is a there is a mass movement to build against what I would describe as definition one. <laughs> um, uh, and that we saw we saw some elements of that, I think, on the streets um, of, of Glasgow. And um, I think there's a lot more um, that we that, that we can do on that. And that is, if you like, the rejection of business as usual um, and pure market led what I would describe as um, neoliberal um, solutions and I think we can build um, a really strong movement against that it's, I'm not saying it's not there already but I think there's an awful lot more to do I guess I'm like about critical engagement with um, what I describe as um, definition two which is where you know government does accept that it has responsibility there is a role um, for um, uh, for the public sphere there is a role for 
Well, government likes to talk about as stakeholders, but that could, on the one level, be a very, um, you know, uh, shallow exercise, or it could be a meaningful exercise um, about um, how we build power and build leverage uh, within that. Um, and uh, there is also a joint campaign to be run, and I think many of the allies who will be rejecting, if you like, the neoliberal approach can be our allies or are our allies already um, in this, which is really to expose how absolutely inadequate um, government investment um, is just now. So, I mean, even compared, as we know, to, to other countries, even uh, compared to Biden, who I never thought I'd sit in many public meetings um, uh, um, uh, being a cheerleader for, even in comparison with some of our European um, comparator nations, the level of investment um, in what's currently being described as the green recovery, but really is about you know, the next phase of the uh, development of the economy is, is absolutely derisory. And that's why, if you like, some of our public, um, public sector, public service del delivery prescriptions seem so far off now. Uh, because the um, is, is because the level of, of investment or pro promise investment is so low, so we need to really leverage hard and build um, uh, joint campaigns. You know, I return to my mantra: bus ownership, get public um, uh, trains back into public ownership um, next year. Um, genuine municipal um, uh, delivery, uh, public sector delivery of of deep retrofitting and a publicly owned um, construction company all have to be core campaigns and I think they're all core campaigns that we can unite a whole set of actors around and I really think that that's um, a major priority for us even as we engage with that um, the critical processes that are necessary under the under the current paradigm and the current uh, government plans. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for mentioning the, the public transport angle, which, which was very much in tune with the debate that's going on in the, the chat at the moment about um, cycling and climate in Scotland. Um, I think introducing the, the, the um, issue of free public transport being about buses and trains, as well as cycling is quite an important one. Anyway, I uh, digress. Um, next is, is Sam to come back. Thanks, Lynn, and thanks for all the brilliant questions and contributions. So it's kind of hard to know where to start with those, but I actually just want to pick on something which came up in the chat, um, which was about climate change and military, because I think this is also something which we don't talk about a lot, particularly both in terms of its climate impacts and obviously how the the rich industrial nations see climate change and in the US particularly as a global security threat, which is why actually they've always been heavily invested in dealing with climate change. And I mentioned that particularly because I think it's very important when it comes to this aspect of ownership, power structures and quality of life, which Eirik um, obviously talked about very much within his paper because there is this whole debate at the moment about rethinking security and obviously with the COVID pandemic that is very much brought to the forefront of people's minds what real security and you know, for want of a better term well-being is in life um, and it links into with this question around being frugal and the nature of consumption because of course um, as Nancy Pelosi admitted at the COP talks um, they're climate change strategy is very much about protecting their borders and their their wealth and the American way of life. So why it's good to see the US back at the climate talks, um, nothing has changed in terms of what their sort of real perspective is on that. So I think it's something, you know, if we do want um, ecologically and socially useful jobs, we have to tackle that whole agenda. And it's another one of those uncomfortable questions in the room, because if we agree with our internationalism and our real solidarity and anti-racism, then as trade unionists in the UK, globally, it's less of an issue in Scotland, thankfully, because of more progressive positions, particularly in the STEC around Trident, for example, we really have to get to a point where we should not have workers invested in producing things that are going to destroy working class sisters and brothers in other parts of the world. So I think it's good to obviously keep that 
um, on the room of the agenda as well. And that does come back to what we talk about in terms of public ownership and democratic control. It's not just nationalization. So it, it should include things like worker co-ops and how we get workers and working class vested interests in there um, to get the transition that we want for working class um, and obviously you know the communities working class to challenge the neoliberal model and which all those things and particularly the the nuclear agenda and the military agenda is very much about thank you thanks very much sam and thanks for for um <coughs> for covering different issues from from the other two discussants as well so i'm going back to eirik who um as the author of the paper has has sat quietly listening to everyone else's uh, perspective on on uh, the issue that, that he's introduced and um you probably feel like you could write another paper now Eric, having having listened to this debate but hopefully it's the beginning of of um some some more dialogue around these issues so over to you Eric. uh thanks thanks very much lynn um, yeah, it's in the nature of Jimmy Reed Foundation publications that they are critical and, and, and challenging and, and, and stimulate debate. And uh, so this is perhaps was slightly daunting, given that I started saying that uh, I, I don't actually get any time in my work to do this. This is as an activist. I do this, squeeze this in, and then to be responded to by, by three trade union officials um, having challenged the trade union movement on a few things could have been quite daunting, but thank you very much to the three of you for uh, very constructive and, and engaging uh, debates that, that we've been having, and I've, I've very much uh, appreciated it. If I can just make a make a few comments, uh, Rachel's point about about being frugal, I think it was, it was very interesting, and in the paper I, I refer to um, a, a book uh, qu quite some time ago. It was written by by uh, Carly and Spappens, where they talk about the difference between efficiency and sufficiency and actually that uh, um, we need to move our economy towards more efficiency which is providing the same goods and services with, um, with with fewer resources but we also need to move our economy towards more sufficiency which is providing a good quality of life with fewer goods and services and that is a very much about public transport it's about um, public ownership of housing public construction etc so uh, I think that focus on quality of life is very much about what uh, another way of saying being frugal. Um, if you start lecturing working people about not doing things, that's not going to get you anywhere. Whereas if you focus on quality of life, what do people really want out of their lives? I think that's what leads us into, into that kind of discussion about sufficiency. Um, the other things is uh, in, in in many ways it's something to celebrate the the fact that the neoliberals are are, are, are taking our, our language it shows that they feel threatened by it um, and that's that's a good in, inevitably there are uh, when ideas and concepts um, uh, emerge from a radical movement um, they they will become uh, challenged they will become uh, there will be attempts to co-opt it there will be attempts to, to distort it and so on so the fact that that's happening is, is in in some ways a positive measure it shows that we are we are challenging the establishment um and certainly i agree with dave taking on that 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 first definition if you like which is not a definition a just transition that has neither justice nor a uh, transition is um uh, is is clearly um empty um and i certainly also agree that you know the second definition we must engage with critical though we may be of it um, and that's some of the some of the excellent examples that Alison talked about that Unison isn't doing is very much engaging with that and making more demands of it and making a bit of progress and then making a bit more progress and making further demands. And a lot of that is about where the funding comes from, as various people like Ian uh, commented. Another part of moving from the second to the to the third um, 
uh, so our, our question is how do we move from the second definition to the third one how do we bring in that radicalism i think how i think workers co-ops is part of that i think nationalization might be part of it in other ways and i think it's a, a question that we're constantly asking ourselves how do we engage with the second definition and keep our eyes our vision on that third definition of a radical transformation and hopefully that's what i wanted to 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 raise our ambition uh, if you like in 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 this this paper and just just sort of finally dave's optimism is is encouraging and 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 sam mentioned the uh, enormous um progress that was made through the COP26 uh, trade union uh, uh, caucus, which I, COP26 coalition trade union caucus, which I uh, completely agree with. It maybe needs a different name because it's a bit of a mouthful, but there was tremendous uh, um, starting of deep dialogue, I think, going on there. And I do hope that that continues past COP26 uh, into the future so that that deep dialogue can continue. Thank you very, very much, everybody, for the discussion. And thank you, Eirik. And I'm sorry we have run out of time because I know at least one other person tried to put their hand up there. Um, I just want to, to first of all, say that um, Jimmy would have loved us, but we would have been here for another hour and a half listening to uh, his, his, his perspective on this. And as I sit here on the Clyde, um, where you know, the, the shipyards and the heavy industry was and, you know, very, very short journey to uh, up the Clyde to Faz Lane, where Trident is, and all of the contradictions of kind of class and campaigning and environment campaigning. And to see that where I'm living is yards from where the COP uh, was held. And I'm just going to finish on this, this funny little anecdote that in my street there were protests and there were delegations and there were corporates and there was everything passing through uh, during the period of the COP. But one evening when I went outside my house, I um, was stopped by a, an 18 year old protester, environmental protester, who asked me if I was part of the COP and I said, no, I live here. And then he began to lecture me about people of your generation high time that you got involved in the movement. The boy stood for 50 minutes while I told him that when I was 15, I joined CND, that was in the Labour Party Young Socialist. When I was 17, I was sitting down on roads. You know, when I was in my early 20s, I was, I was a trade union activist and so on and so forth. So whilst he wasn't particularly engaging me, I wasn't particularly engaging him either because I just shouted him down. So. I think I could be part of your, your deep dialogue, Eric, to try and to try and reach out across um, what we define as as the movement. Um, I thought that was probably quite a helpful example to close the meeting on. The final thing I want to say is I want to thank Eric for the paper and for um, for everyone that's involved in um, helping out tonight, particularly Gregor Gall. Um, who has been given a kind of swift lesson in how to host a, a Zoom meeting, um, but also to not just Dave Moxham of the STUC, but to the STUC itself for allowing us to use their um, Zoom facilities um, to, to, to have this meeting tonight. And I want to thank all of you for attending, speakers, contributors, people that have placed a lot of really brilliant information in the chat thank you for doing that and we'll we'll um try and capture all of that because a lot of the links will be really really helpful in taking the conversation forward so this is a launch of the paper it will be on the <clears throat> the reach foundation uh, website i think tonight um we can take it further i i'm sure will be available to um to, to, to take bookings at further events and as will all of our, our discussants. So thank you very much. And um, I hope you have a, a pleasant rest of your evening. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks. Thank you. That's great. Thanks again. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay,